Right. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Professor Sean Tavelia, founding member of the board of Hamptons Observatory and academic chair of physical sciences at Suffolk County Community College. On behalf of my fellow board members and colleagues at Suffolk County Community College, I would like to welcome everyone to tonight's presentation. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our organization, the Hamptons Observatory was founded roughly 17 years ago with a mission to provide year-round family-friendly educational events that focus on science and the natural world. After the presentation, please uh, visit the Hamptons Observatory website to learn about the future presentations, join our email list, or donate to, ensure, to help ensure that we can continue providing these incredible opportunities. Uh, if you feel inspired by tonight, uh, feel free to, to visit Suffolk County Community College, where you can begin your journey into a scientific career at one of our three campuses, if you're a local, uh, in Brentwood, Selden, or Riverhead, New York, or from the comfort of your home in our online offerings. Uh, as we begin tonight's presentation, I ask that you keep your microphones muted. Uh, please feel free to post questions in the chat at the conclusion of the presentation, we will do our best to address all questions. So with that, uh, tonight's presenter uh, received his bachelor's in physics from uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1981, and an MS uh, master's in physics from Columbia University in 1987. He began his career in 1981 with the RCA Astro Space Division in East Windsor, New Jersey, designing flight antennas for commercial and defense communications and remote uh, sensing satellites. In 1990, he joined General Electric's Astrospace Division, designing commercial um, Department of Events and Civil Space Systems. In 1995, he took a position as Director of Systems Engineer in the Orbital Science Corporation. And in 1997, he took a position as Deputy Program Manager for the Hubble Space Telescope Service Group at Lockheed Martin. Uh, he began working on the pre-phase study of the Next Generation Space Telescope in 1998. And in June 2004, he took his current position as the NASA Mission Systems Engineer for the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Mike Manzel to tonight's presentation, which I should uh, also uh, announce that it is the one year anniversary for the science release of the James Webb Space Telescope. So please, uh, thank you, Mike, and I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Okay, just a final sound check. Everyone can hear me, right, Sean? Sounds good. Okay, well, thank you for having me. And yeah, as Sean said, I've been the um, the mission systems engineer for uh, for James Webb for almost 20 years now. And I've been working the job uh, as starting for Lockheed Martin for almost 26 years now. So thank you for having me and uh, letting me give you this presentation. So let's get started. Um, just a quick overview of James Webb. It is the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. It is, its mission objective is to study the origin evolution of galaxies, stars, planetary systems. It is an international team. It is led by the Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, that place that I work. But it is an international collaboration with the European and Canadian space agencies. Our prime contractor for the U.S. is Northrop Grumman. Our ground segment is provided by the Space Telescope Science Institute here in Baltimore. And our science instrument providers come from the, uh, the University of Arizona, ESA, JPL, and a European consortium, and the Canadian Space Agency. And, and in a nutshell, it is a deployed six and a half meter diameter segmented uh, uh, telescope, segmented primary mirror. It operates at cryogenic temperatures at the Earth Sun L2 point. And that's a point on the other side of the Earth from the Sun, about a million miles away, four times farther than the Sun. And that point follows, uh, follows the Earth around the Sun so that the observatory is always behind the Earth and it orbits the Sun in about 365 days. We were launched uh, on Christmas Day, 2021. We released our first science uh, images one year ago tomorrow. And uh, we're required to have a five-year mission, but believe me, we, uh, we have every expectation of launching, uh, of lasting longer than 10 years, which is our goal. So 
I want to talk about uh, a couple topics. First, I want to talk about the science of the James Webb Space Telescope. It was conceived uh, on paper back in around 1995. And back in those days, which was shortly after the Hubble was up there, uh, scientists got together and they came up with four science themes for the next telescope. The first one was to see the very first stars and uh, galaxies that turned on after the Big Bang. Now, we believe our universe began with that Big Bang somewhere around 13.8 to 13.7 billion years ago. After that Big Bang, things went dark. And somewhere, uh, somewhere around 400 million years after that, the first stars and galaxies turned on. They wanted a telescope that would see those very first stars, that would see as far back in space and time as you could possibly see. Next, they wanted this telescope to look at the way galaxies evolve over cosmic time. When we look at galaxies near our own Milky Way, relatively close, they come in two varieties. They come as pinwheels, called spiral galaxies, or they come as, uh, as what we call ellipticals. They're very, their structure is very orderly. But when we look very far away in the universe, they don't look that orderly. They look like amorphous blobs. So we want to see how those amorphous blobs evolve into these structured, structured uh, objects. Next. We want to see how stars are born in our own Milky Way galaxy. And, and these stars are born in nebulae, vast clouds of gas and dust. Finally, they wanted to see how solar systems are born and formed around stars. These were the four science themes that formed or were the basis of the James Webb Space Telescope. And these were conceived around 1995. And in the course of that, those you know, two decades, there was another science theme that came out. Uh, after 19, in the 1990s, early 1990s, we, to start, we started to discover planets around other stars. They're called exoplanets. They were discovered primarily as uh, the way they make small eclipses in front of the star they orbit called transits. Well, we, James Webb was, uh, was designed in such a way that it was obvious we could actually do detailed studies of these exoplanets. And today, we know of about 5,000 of these planets around other stars, these exoplanets. So this was the fifth theme that was added on to James Webb. Well, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, although most of my training is in, in astronomy and physics. But as an engineer, I have to take, as a systems engineer, I have to take these four or these five science themes, these five science objectives, and turn them into a language that uh, engineers understand. And those are the engineer, those are, that's the language of requirements. So when you're building a space telescope, there are you know, several very common requirements that you want to know uh, to build the telescope. First, it's spectral coverage. What colors shall we observe in? Next, what's the radiometric sensitivity? How faint? are the objects we want to see. Next, our field of regard. How much of the sky do we want to see? And that's an easy one. Astronomers want to see everything. And finally, resolution and image quality, which boils down to what's the smallest object that we want to see clearly or we want to discern. So these were the main requirements that I had to formulate and we had to give out to our design team. So first, let's talk about spectral coverage. Uh, what colors? does James Webb want to observe in? Well, if you want to see the very, very farthest, uh, the very farthest galaxies there are to see, and the very first galaxies there are to see, those galaxies consist of probably very young and bright blue stars. Those stars emit a lot of short wavelength blue light, but that short wavelength blue light is traveling through a universe that has been expanding for over 13 billion years. So just like a slinky, that light that's of short wavelength gets stretched out. And by the time it reaches us, it's not blue light. It's actually long, has a wavelength longer than red light. It's actually infrared light. So if you want to see these galaxies, the very first ones that are turned on, you're not going to be looking in visible light. You're going to want to look in the infrared. Next, 
If you want to see stars being born, well, they're born in these vast clouds, these nebulae, and in these dust cocoons. Visible light doesn't penetrate dust. However, infrared light does penetrate dust, especially that infrared light of wavelength. Yeah, well, they shouldn't work with the Bible because I. Uh... I'm sorry, did somebody, uh, is there a question? No, somebody accidentally unmuted. Keep okay, going. that's fine. So the uh, the wavelengths that James Webb wants to operate in are going to be the infrared with a wavelength between 0.6 and 28 microns. So it's going to be not a visible telescope like Hubble, but an infrared telescope. Next, what's its sensitivity? What are the faintest things that it wants to see? Well, astronomers took a stab at that and they said, hey, we want to be able to detect an 11 nano Jansky point source to a signal to noise ratio of 10 for an exposure time of 10,000 seconds, about two and a half hours. Now, for those that don't know what a nano Jansky is, it's 10 to the minus 35 watts per meter squared per hertz. And to most people, that's about as clear as mud. So let me try to clear it up for you. If you take a child's nightlight, which puts out about five watts and put it on the moon and looks look at it from the earth. That would appear to be about 20 nanojanskis. So we're looking for things as faint as that or fainter. Well, how do you do that? Well, most amateur astronomers know if you wanna see something faint, you build a telescope that's very wide. You build a big telescope. And our telescope had to be at least six and a half meters in diameter. And at that size, it only collects one photon per second from these very faint sources. And to put that in perspective, for those that know a little astronomy, if you go out tonight and look at the star Vega, your eye, as small as it is, is collecting about close to a million photons per second from Vega. So this is how we're gonna uh, actually detect these small sources. Now, by the way, that's only half the battle. The other half that I'll talk about in a couple charts is that while you get about one photon per second from the faint galaxy you want to see, you're getting about three photon per second from our solar system, from the dust in our solar system. So, so you have to figure out a way to subtract out that natural noise level. Now, can we build a, a telescope that's six and a half meters in diameter? Sure. We got one in Hawaii that's 10 meters in diameter. And when astronomers went to build this telescope, the Keck telescope, they decided to change their, uh, their way of doing it. Rather than making one mirror that's 10 meters in diameter, they decided to make a 10 meter mirror out of about 36 individual smaller mir mirrors that are all shaped and positioned to act like one big parabolic mirror. Well, if it's good enough for the Keck telescope, it's good enough for us. So James Webb decided that we would make our telescope out of about uh, 18 individual hexagonal segments that would all be shaped and positioned to act as one big mirror. And by the way, I like to brag about this a little, even though the te uh, Keck telescope is 10 meters and we're only about six, given the absorption by the atmosphere, we will still act like a much bigger telescope than Keck. Okay, so we know how to build a big telescope. We know how to get all the photons that we want to get, but there's a second problem to, to, the, to detecting something faint. You got to make sure that the noise is, um, is small. Now, they tell me never put math in a public, in a public presentation, but uh, I, I give you guys more credit than that. I'm not going to get into this equation too much, but this is the one equation that ruled my life for 25 years. It's called the signal to noise equation. And basically what it has is a ratio of the signal you want. That's the top. That's what you want over divided by the noise, the stuff that you don't want. And that equation is in the upper right. And I'm not going to get into details other than to say first. In the top, that signal. And we've done everything what we can to maximize that signal. We've made a humongous telescope. But in the denominator, there's a bunch of stuff that represents the noise, the bad stuff that you don't want. 
And two of those things predominate or dominate that. And there are those called a background and dark current. The background that you have there, that B, is actually the emission that our telescope itself could add to noise. And we want to minimize that. And when I had to explain this equation to my, my managers, who are more worried about cost than schedule, I wanted to, I made a little picture to try to demonstrate. If you take a 10,000 uh, second exposure of a point source that's only 10 nanojanskis, that's what it looks like. You can see it, you're pretty good. But you have to subtract out the background, and the background noise is almost as bright as the point source that you're looking at. So when you do that, that subtraction, you'll find that the pixels right in the middle, those are the pixels that actually represent the signal. Now, for those that know a little bit of math, you know there's always a danger in subtracting two almost equally big numbers and counting on the difference. In other words, having the, uh, the reliability of that difference to be high. The only way you can really do this, and this is one of the things that dominated my engineering life for 25 years, is to make that background, to make that noise as small as you possibly can. And for an infrared telescope, that's pretty hard to do. Why? Well, because things at room temperature glow in the infrared. And we don't want our telescope and we don't want our mirrors and our observatory to glow in the infrared brighter than the very faint stars that we're trying to see. So in order to combat that, in order to get around that, the telescope, all six and a half meters of it, all three metric tons has to be cooled down to only 55 degrees above absolute zero. That's minus about 370 degrees Fahrenheit. That is very, very hard to do. And, and, and in addition to keeping the, tele, the three metric ton telescope cold, we also want to keep the science instruments cold because there's another noise source. That's called dark current. And dark current, and that's, uh, that, that's just bad electrical noise, that can be minimized if you keep the detectors very cold and they have to be kept at around 40 degrees Kelvin. So as an engineer, this is our problem, making a big telescope that has to be cold. How do you do it? Well, you're not gonna build a refrigerator to put in space that can do that. Instead, we said, look, let's put the telescope, not in earth orbit, but in an orbit that follows the earth around the sun. It's called the second Lagrange point. It's about a million miles away from the Earth, or 1.5 million kilometers. And when we put the telescope there, the sun, the Earth, and the moon, all the stuff that's relatively hot, is on one side of the spaceship. So having done that, if we now build a big umbrella called a sun shield, that sun shield can shade our telescope and our instruments from all the hot stuff and let it passively cool down to these cold temperatures. And by the way, that sun shield is no ordinary umbrella. Over 200,000 watts of solar radiation will strike it. And we can only allow 0 0.02 watts to come through. So folks, I, I tell people, if, uh, if this were suntan lotion, it ha would have an SPF of 10 million. Now that sun shield has to be big enough to shade the telescope at all its various positions. And that's dictated, the side of the sun shield is dictated by how much of the sky we want to see at any one time. And we had decided very early on, well, we want to be able to tilt our telescope five degrees toward the sun, up to 45 degrees away from the sun. And if we turn it 360 degrees around the align to the sun, that sun shield can shade our telescope and we can see about 39% of the sky at any time. Well, that's good, but astronomers want to see the whole sky. And to see the whole sky, as you follow the Earth around the sun every 365 days, all the constellations will go in and out of your field of regard. So you get to see the whole sky, but you have to wait the year to see it. At any one time, you see about 39% of the full sky. Now, to do this, we, the sun shield has to be as big as a tennis court. 
The final requirement that we have to do for James Webb is uh, answer the question, well, what's the smallest thing you want to see? And astronomers right off the bat said, hey, we want to have resolution as good as Hubble. And Hubble can see things as small as 0.084 arc seconds or 84 milli arc seconds. And once again, you want to know what 84 milli arc seconds looks like, take a penny, put it 30 miles away, and that you'll be able to see the penny if you have that resolution. Now, to, to get that resolution, there's a fundamental limit that will stop you from getting perfect resolution. And that has to do with the wave nature of light. If you look at the chart over here, if light wasn't a wave, if, it, if light really truly traveled as, as rays, you could take a lens and you could focus those rays to a perfect spot. And that would mean that if you plot intensity versus, uh, versus you know, distance, you could get a perfectly po focused spot, a perfectly sp focused sp uh, spike. Unfortunately, light is a wave. And when wave sees an edge, like the edge of your lens, it ripples. And that ripple causes some of that energy that you really want to focus to go in directions that you don't want it to go. And that's called diffraction. And because of diffraction, instead of getting a perfect spot, you're going to get a blur spot. We call it a point spread function. And the width of that point spread function is really dictated by the wavelength that you're looking at, which is generally a small number, which means the angle will be small, which is good, but divided by the diameter of your telescope. So the bigger the diameter, the better the resolution you're going to get. You know, when you see a picture of a star in a, in a book, in a textbook, it looks like that. People believe, some people believe that's the star, and believe me, it is not. The actual star is much, much smaller than that. What you're actually seeing is the blur spot from the telescope. Well, the, you know, the blur spot of the telescope is fundamentally determined by the wavelength divided by the diameter. You want, the blow, you want it to be small? Make your diameter big. But there's something else that can go against you. You also have to make your telescope to have very, very good optics, no imperfections, very small imperfections. And as a rule of thumb, we want our imperfections, the total of them all, to be less than a wavelength divided by 14. When that happens and you put those imperfections into, into a lens or a mirror, they cause the, the focus or the wave front, the focus wave front, to have some defects in them. And that expands out your blur spot, making your resolution a little, a little worse. But if your overall error is lambda over 14, it, the spreading really, really doesn't become that noticeable. Now, for, that, for James Webb, that means that our overall error in all our optics cannot be bigger than 150 nanometers because we want to see our best performance at a wavelength of 2 microns. Well, 150 nanometers is about 160, 100, well, one uh, six hundred and seventieth of the width of a piece of paper, which, by the way, for optics is not that hard to do. So we got to make our optics relatively good, but we don't have to be heroes about this. And that's because, once again, we're an infrared telescope and not a ultraviolet visible telescope like Hubble. But there's something else in order to keep our resolution good. We also have to make sure that we don't jitter, that our pointing stability is very, very good. And our pointing stability to get our resolution that we want has to be about seven milli arc seconds. If you want to know what that looks like, well, put James Webb at the Capitol, put a laser pointer on it, put a penny on the Empire State Building 224 miles away. And we have to design a pointing system that will keep the laser spot on the penny. And actually, that isn't too hard to do. Actually, the Hubble Space Telescope, its pointing system does exactly that. So we knew how to do that. Well, we're done with putting together requirements. So now we all started to design the system. When we designed our telescope, it looked like this. It stands about three stories tall. It has a, a sun shield about the size of a tennis court. The individual mirror is made of 18 individual hexagonal mirrors that make up what we call our optical telescope element. 
The sun shield, as I say, is our umbrella. It consists of five individual layers that gets us an SPF of about 10 million. And then we have our science instruments that attach to the telescope in a compartment behind it called the Integrated Science Instrument Module, or the ISOM. And finally, we have the spacecraft bus. The, teles the overall observatory weighs about six metric tons, has a power generation of about two kilowatts. And uh, well, let's give you the other tour here. Here's a, a, a better picture of the, of the observatory. There's our, our telescope. It, is, uh, it has an 18 segment primary mirror, a secondary mirror out there in front. Behind it is the integrated science instrument module with our four science instruments. Our five layer umbrella, our five layer sun shield, and our spacecraft bus that contains the, uh, the kind of traditional usual subsystems, pointing, uh, communication, propulsion, that kind of thing. As I said, our it stands about two store, uh, three. Uh, excuse me, it stands about three stories tall, and uh, it has a tennis court sized sun shield. There's me next to it. That observatory has to fit into a rocket nose cone that's that big. The available rocket nose cones fairings are about five meters in diameter. So to get that into a five meter diameter fairing, we had to do, we had to fold it up, which means we had to unfold it on orbit in some of the most ungodly maneuvers that I'd ever want to attempt. The telescope itself is shown here. It's called a tri-mirror and a stigmat. It's very similar to the Hubble. It's very similar to a Cassegrain. Mirror, uh, light comes in from the right hits that big uh, six meter primary mirror, is focused to a secondary mirror out in front that's shaped like a hyperboloid. It then gets focused and bounced off a third tertiary mirror back to a flat mirror. And that flat mirror is called a fine steering mirror. And that's, uh, that actually turns, it actually keeps us, uh, it's controlled by a control loop that keeps the star focused where we want it to be focused. So any kind of small movement of the telescope or the observatory is canceled out or corrected by that fine steering mirror. We have four science instruments. The first one comes from the University of Arizona. It's called the NIRCAM, and it sees in the near infrared from about 0.6 to 5 microns. It gives you the pretty pictures that you've seen. There's a near infrared spectrometer from the European Space Agency that gives us spectra of up to 100 galaxies at the same time. 100 individual objects simultaneously. We have a mid-infrared instrument that is both spectrometer and imager that comes from ESA and JPL. And that is in the mid-infrared from five microns all the way out to 28. And finally, there's a fine guidance sensor. That's the guidance sensor that sees the stars the way they move and controls that fine steering mirror. And in addition to that, we have another infrared camera that both of them provided by the Canadian Space Agency. Finally, you know, my job as a systems engineer, so I have to also design the system. The system includes the ground stations and the control center. So we're going to use the JPL Deep Space Network and the Space Telescope Science Institute that actually controls the Hubble as well. We'll launch on an Ariane 5 launcher. And that was a donation in kind from the European Space Agency. Uh, it was a donation, and in return for that donation, we let them fly two, uh, I mean, two science instruments that I've just described. That launcher puts, on a, puts us on a direct path out to that L2 point. On the way out, we'll do a lot of unfolding and things like that. And then we will literally fall into the orbit around that L2 point. And by that time, we would be ready to, to start our mission. So this is what the overall system architecture looks like. The deployments, though, those were, uh, those were a very, very big deal. And we have an animation here put together by Northrop Grumman on the deployment sequence, the most complicated ever attempted by a space, uh, by an observatory. We just come off the upper stage of the Arian. We position ourselves and deploy our solar array so that we can 
get solar power. Next, we are, we are coasting out past the moon. And after about a couple of days, it was about two days when we passed the moon, we do our last maneuver and then to correct any launch vehicle errors. And then the fun starts. We have some two big panels that will fold down. These were called UPSs, unitized pallet structures. They held the stowed sunshield membranes for launch. The forward one and the aft one comes down. Then we lift the telescope up on a tower by about a meter. Then we release 107 release mechanisms. Roll-up covers unfold, uh, roll up. Those were protecting the sunshield during launch. Two telescoping mid-boom assemblies, one on each side, pulls the layers out, and then individual pulleys and motors tighten each of those five layers, almost like tightening the sails on a ship, because they have to have the right shape to get that SPF of 10 million. We un unfold and un unfurl some other shields, thermal shields. We deploy our secondary mirror. It falls down on that tripod and locks. And then finally, two wings from the primary mirror fold and lock in place. The, all the deployments were scheduled to take 14 days, and that's what they did. We did it in 14 days. And then on the way out, we start to cool down to those cryogenic temperatures. This is a, a plot of what our actual orbit looks like. You can see the moon's orbit there. So we're about four times farther than the moon. We deploy, we do all those deployments on the way out. And after the last deployment is done, we start our cool down. And then we fall into an orbit around the L2 point and at launch plus six months, everything's calibrated, everything's done and we begin our science mission. And I'm proud to say, we did it on schedule. So I have some, some baby pictures of the observatory now of, of how we built it and how we put it together. The first, we had to test the individual uh, mirror segments. They were tested in groups of six down at, the John, uh, down at the Marshall Space Flight Center. And there you can see six of them going into the cold chamber to be tested. And after they were tested, we put them in protective containers. And they were in those protective containers for about five years. Uh, in the meantime, the structure of the telescope was being built out at Northrop Grumman in California. You can see the structure on the, on the right-hand side there. In December of 2015, the individual segments were mounted to the, uh, to the structure. And in 2015, we had our six-meter telescope. You can see a, a man on a diving board there, as we call it, taking the protective dust covers off the, uh, off the mirrors. The individual four, uh, four instruments arrived at Goddard. The mid-infrared infra instrument called MIRI, the fine guidance sensor, FGS, near-infrared camera, near cam, and the near-infrared spectrometer, near spec. When they arrived at Goddard, we mounted them on a common structure called, that's called the ISOM. And this picture, uh, we should have really had a, uh, an individual in the picture. It, it doesn't convey the sheer size of this thing. That near spec is the big silver thing that you see on the right-hand side. And that near spectrometer is about the size of a queen-size mattress. These instruments were huge. Then the ISOM was lowered onto the back of the telescope and mounted onto the telescope. And then we propped the telescope up and tested it optically, but we tested it at ambient temperatures. Now this telescope was not designed to work correctly at ambient temperatures. But what we did was we, we took a look at the mirror as it looked at ambient, and it, looked, it doesn't look great, by the way. We then uh, brought it into a chamber to shake it and to uh, uh, expose it to acoustics acoustic waves, the kind of acoustics that it would see during launch. Then we brought it back into this chamber and looked to see if the prescription of the mirrors changed. And we're happy to say they did not. So the mirrors did not change. They withstood the vibration and the acoustic environments. After this, we shipped it down to the Johnson Space Flight Center, where there's a chamber down there 
uh, we call Chamber A. It's where the Apollo uh, missions were tested. And that chamber is about seven stories tall. We retrofitted it so that it became one of the world's largest cryovac chambers. That chamber brought the telescope down to the cryogenic operational temperatures that it would need to operate in space. And it was at these temperatures that we had to test to make sure that the mirrors actually work the way we thought they would at their temperatures. And I'm proud to say they did. Now, unless there's an optician in the group, this was uh, this was the shot that proved it. Unless you know anything about uh, inter interferograms, it might not make a lot of sense to you, but these wavy lines, this wavy line picture of the primary mirror at temperature showed that the mirrors were acting exactly the way they should. Meanwhile, out at Northrop Grumman in the summer of 2017, we were building the spacecraft and the sun shield. And here you see the, uh, the, the spacecraft bus before we put the sun shield layers on. That's it after we put the sun shield layers on. And in September 2019, telescope met spacecraft and we finally had an official James Webb Observatory. I'm going to show you a quick clip of that now. I'm sorry that the sound isn't coming through on this, but what you can see is this time lapse of uh, the telescope being mounted to the top of the spacecraft bus. <coughs> And after it was mounted, we started our observatory test program that included deployment tests of the sun shield that you can see being tightened here, all five of those layers. The telescope of the observatory test program lasted almost two years. And finally, in October 2021, we shipped it by barge from LA down to its launch site in French Guiana. It arrived down there and we put the fairing on the rocket, we called encapsulation, on December 23rd, 2021. And then we rolled it out to the launch pad. And on Christmas day, 2021, we started our mission. Once again, I apologize that the sound isn't coming through, but this was the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, Christmas morning, 2021. The, one of the perks of launching on a French rocket was I got about 25 trips to Paris. Unfortunately, I do not speak a lick of French. And I told people the, the countdown was in, in French. And I told folks, if I heard the word sacre bleu just once, I would have jumped out of my skin. But the launch was perfect. Uh, the Arian put us right on the spot. We didn't need much fuel at all to correct any errors at all. So you see the rocket going up there from French Guiana in South America. That's on the East Coast. The launch, uh, launch goes over about 30 minutes. And about 30 minutes after the launch, I got a chance to say goodbye to the observatory that I've been working on for about 20, 26 years. We put cameras on top of the, um, the upper stage of the Arian. So we got to see the actual separation and, as a bonus, the deployment of the solar array from the Arian launcher. And once again, the separation from the Arian was perfect. This is the actual uh, James Webb Observatory being pushed off. On the bottom there, on the Earth, boy, that, that you can see uh, that's Saudi Arabia and Africa and the inlet to the Red Sea. Normally, when you separate from a launcher, uh, your, your observatory can have some tip, some tip and tilt. We, and uh, the thrusters would normally null those rates, steady it down. But for us, the, uh, the release was rock solid. There were no tip off rates to null. And because of that, even though I didn't expect to see it, our solar array deployed early enough for the cameras to catch it. And you'll be able to see that in just about a second, which was a real bonus for me. I wasn't expecting to see this. 
you can see the illumination on the uh, on the observatory peak up because we're pointing right to the sun now. And as I say, as a bonus, I got to see the solar array, the first critical deployment actually go on, which was something that I was really, really not expecting to see. It comes out, you can see the sun strike it, which was just a beautiful thing. That was one deployment that we did not want to delay. Well, after that, everything went uh, remarkably uneventful. Our launch and separation was right on, right on schedule. My 14 days of terror for the deployments finished right on time. All the deployments were complete by January 8, 2022. We cooled down. And by the way, the cool down portion of this telescope, it would be too complicated to explain, but that's a very complicated procedure because um, you don't want some things cooling down, some things not cooling down, and water venting off one part and freezing on another. So we had to plan the way the observatory cooled down very, very carefully. By uh, March 2028, all the telescope was deployed and fully focused. By April of, of by April 22nd, 2022, all the instruments were in focus. And by July 12th, 2022, a year, a year from tomorrow, a year, not tomorrow, we released our first images and our science mission began. And those first images, this is one of the first ones I saw. I saw this about a week before it was released. This is a deep field. It's an image of a galaxy cluster. SMAX 0723, those big arcs that you see there are actually gravitational lenses or are gravity, gravitational lensed images of a galaxy that's much farther away than this, than this uh, cluster. When my wife first saw this picture, she said, this looks just like Hubble. And you know, she's exactly right. It does look like Hubble. But what really impressed me, and this is why this was one of my favorite pictures, probably my favorite, was that uh, Hubble took 14 days to take the picture that she was thinking of. This, James Webb, did this in less than 12 hours. And in less than 12 hours, we broke Hubble's record. That image has galaxies in it that now hold the record for the farthest galaxies ever seen. And that one of them in there its light has been traveling to us for over 13.1 billion years. That, we broke Hubble's record in only 12 hours. And now the astronomers are really cranking up to do exposures of not 12 hours, but rather weeks. And I remember when I saw this picture, I turned to a colleague and I said, you know, we had designed James Webb to see the very farthest galaxies there are. And when I saw this picture, I turned to him and I said, we did it. Whatever is out there, we're going to see it. Some of the other pictures that came out were the Stephens Quintet. These are five galaxies, four of which are actually colliding. And they're actually merging together. The one uh, galaxy of the five is kind of like just a photobomber, the NGC 7320. But the other four galaxies are actually merging together. And this, this is the way that astronomers believe small amorphous blob galaxies evolve into big structured galaxies. We took, we released the cosmic cliffs, the Carina Nebula. This is an area where star birth is going on right now. And you can see some of that star birth. First, we can see uh, those uh, columns. That, that dust column is a place where the, um, the nebula is being evaporated by the new stars that are actually, that have just been born. But that column is a place where the gas and dust is more dense, so it's evaporating more slowly. We see new stars being born. One is right there. And we also see, as new stars are born, gas jets coming out of them. This is a star that's not being born. It's a star that's actually starting its death cycle. This is the planetary nebula, the Southern Ring Nebula. It's an older star that is just kind of almost backfiring like an engine backfires and blowing shells of its matter off. 
And then, although this picture doesn't look all that that pretty, this is a spectrum of one of the exoplanets, WASP 96b, and it shows clearly that this exoplanet has the spectral signatures of water. Now, Hubble actually uh, took this spectra before we did, but this was a, because of the way that these, uh, these spectra look, Astronomers have detected and confirmed that not only is there not only water in the atmosphere of this exoplanet, there are also water clouds. And this was the first time that actual clouds, cloud signatures have been detected. Well, since those first releases that came out, there's been a multitude of other pictures. You can see them here. But my favorite of all these was certainly the rings of Neptune. I was asked to go on Jake Tapper. Uh, on CNN one night, and uh, Jake Tapper looked at this, and he said, oh, that's very pretty, but I've seen that before. And I said, well, I don't think you have, because he thought he was looking at Saturn. No, he is looking at Neptune. Since then, we've also had the pictures of the iconic Pillars of Creation, uh, M16, that uh, became uh, kind of iconic by, um, you know, uh, by Hubble. But now James Webb has done one better. By the way, as you look at this thing, when you see those very, very uh, bright reddish areas, uh, astronomers nicknamed them red lava, but those are actually new stars that are blowing off uh, jets as they're being born. And next, just recently, we put out the rings of Neptune, uh, rings of Uranus. That also looks, looks you know, remarkably pretty. It, these rings, the rings of Neptune and the rings of Uranus, when you look at them optically, they are actually pathetic looking. But when you look at them in the infrared, they're, they're just things of beauty. Just a quick uh, statement about our observatory status. We've been up there a year and we're working perfectly. We're working two and a half times better than we designed to. Um, our stray light levels are very low. Uh, everything is, is going much, much better than we ever planned. And after a year in orbit, we've experienced the full range of expected orbital environments. We've been through several flares, several solar proton events, several uh, dozens of coronal mass ejections, no lasting effects. You may have heard in the news, we've been, we, were, we get struck by meteors, micrometeors. And by the way, those are about the size of dust particles. The press never seems to say that. We've had uh, 41 events so far. And of the 41 events, only 40, uh, 40 of them were in family with our predicts. We designed it to withstand these impacts. There was one, however, in May of 2022 that was out of family with our expectations. It was larger than we thought. But even after that, we still are, are two times better in terms of our angular resolution than we're supposed to. So the telescope is working two times better than we'd ever thought. Here's the looks of the, these are the plots of some of the environments we went through, the flares, the high proton fluxes. And if you want to see where we are in our orbit, this is what our orbit actually looks like to scale. And for the month of June, that's where we were between those two points. And you can see it there. I just want to sort of finish up by, you know, what made James Webb so hard? Well, it was first the deployments. 50 major deployments that used 178 release mechanisms, 155 motors, over 600 pulley assemblies, and had over 344 single point failures, over 86 of them associated with deployments. A single point failure is one that if that component fails, you fail the mission. Well, the deployments were a nightmare but I'm proud to say they went on perfectly. And by the way, the testing of the deployments, we tested the observatory about three times. We might have tested it more, but people didn't realize, and had, we had to educate headquarters, how hard it is to deploy and fold this thing. It took about three to four individual cherry pickers to fold this, uh, this tennis court size sun shield. And every time it did, we all got goosebumps. Look at how close that cherry picker is to our beautiful six, six meter mirror. And every time we had to refold it and retest it, we actually put a little wear and tear on it. So we had to find a good balance between 
testing enough and testing too much. Also, to make a telescope that's cryogenic is, is, uh, is remarkably hard because you have to chart every little leak path that there is through the telescope and through the observatory to make sure that, you know, we had a, a, an unexpected leak, thermal leak of a, of a watt or less, we wouldn't make our temperatures. So we had to have make sure that all these individual heat leaks were mapped correctly. Also, when you make a mirror to act at cryogenic temperatures, well, the mirror itself distorts. If you uh, polish a mirror perfectly at ambient temperatures, and then you de de put, bring it down to cryogenic temperatures, it distorts, it warps. So what we had to do was polish the mirror at ambient, bring it down to cryo temperatures, measure it, look where the bumps were, and then put polish in valleys at the bumps, such that when it went back to cryogenic, it assumed the right shape. That was not an easy thing to do. Also, we had to make sure that uh, the, the way the, the mirrors contract with cold and the way the structure contracts with cold were compatible with each other. We had to make sure that as one contracted faster than the other, we didn't put stresses into the mirror that would distort it. And finally, when things get cold, they end up ringing like a bell. So that means that whatever little disturbance you have in your spacecraft doesn't go away, it just persists. So we had to put what we call dampers to make sure that these ringing didn't cause us any kind of jitter. Finally, the testing the observatory was, was remarkably hard. You couldn't test it as an observatory. If you tried to, well, you'd have to build another six meter telescope, what we call a collimator. And that would have to be a cryogenic telescope in the cryogenic chamber. And then you have to make sure that the sun shield was, uh, the hot side of the sun shield was insulated from the cold side of the observatory. So that those bad thermal photons from the hot side don't disturb your tests on the cold side. Then you have to, the observatory can't withstand its own weight in 1G, so you have to put offloaders on it. In the end, this system would just be too complicated to test the telescope or the observatory as a fully built observatory. So instead, what we had to do was test it in parts, make sure the parts work correctly, then put them into a big math model of the observatory and use math mathematical models to predict what our performance would be. And we did that and our performance was, was right on the money. So just to sum up, telescopes during my life, I wanted to be an astronomer when I was a kid. And when I was a kid, the biggest telescope on earth was the uh, Mount Palomar Observatory out in San Diego. It's about five meters in diameter, weighs, uh, weighs in about 545 tons. And this is what I wanted to do. I would have never dreamed when I was a kid, I would have been lucky enough to be on a team that would make a telescope bigger than Mount Palomar. And it's not in the hills of San Diego, but four times farther than the moon. It's been a long gratifying journey for me. I have the honor of being the systems engineer of this almost from womb to tomb. So I've seen it evolve from, from cartoons all the way to waving goodbye to it as it drifted out, out into space. In summary, the James Webb is now the premier astronomical tool, hopefully for the next couple of decades, it'll address some of the most fundamental questions before us. It's truly a first of its kind space observatory has offered the engineering team some very unique and difficult challenges. It will rewrite the books on astronomy and it's already rewriting the books for future space observatories. And before I just wrap up, I wanna show you two other charts. When I took this job, when I started working on this telescope 26 years ago, I had a picture in my mind of what I wanted to do if it worked. It was uh, something I saw on a bumper sticker on a, on a messed up old car that uh, had a bumper sticker that said, well, my other car is a Mercedes. And fortunately, because everything worked out right, this is the, this is the picture that I've had in my mind for 26 years. I am an amateur astronomer, that's my uh, Celestron 8, but uh, my other telescope is a six meter cryogenic telescope, a million miles in space. And that's the family that put up with me for the past 26 years. So I'll leave you with this thought. 
that although I said I was waving goodbye to my observatory for the last time, the truth is if you have a, a telescope, about six, 16 inch telescope, you can see it out there. It's out there, it's sitting out there. It's a new star in the sky. And it started its five year mission to boldly see what no one has seen before. So I thank you for your attention. I'll take whatever questions you want to give me and um, thank you. Well, Mike, thank you so much. Uh, that was incredible. Uh, I think we all knew just how much went into this telescope. I, I don't think we all fully understood exactly what went into it. It really is amazing. And all I know is I'm, I'm never going to complain about packing anything ever again. <laughs> <laughs> One thing out of there. A few questions that came up in, in the chat, and I'm sure there are others, so feel free to post them in there while, while we're going through these. Uh, one is from Jason, who met you at Intrepid Kids a couple of months ago, and he had a question about the equation that you posted in terms of the noise. How, is, how do we know what that is? Well, um, Jason, when you take, uh, when you, uh, when you take, uh, I'm long, <laughs> First of all, there are equations that that uh, that can be used for that noise. For instance, uh, for the background, you can use an equation that's called black body radiation equation to figure out how much light would come from something that is at room temperature. So there are a set of equations that look at that look like that. And for uh, for a lot of those equations or for a lot of those things, what you're looking at is not the um, not the actual value, but the actual uncertainty in that value. So uh, I, with, without getting into, uh, if we were on a whiteboard, and we, I could I could actually write these equations out for you and show you. But I can tell you that for all the things in there, for dark current, for the uh, the black body, for the uh, black body thermal emissions, we have equations for each of those things. And uh, if you know the temperatures, that was the primary input to most of them. Another question from Budima. Um about the error in the optics. And the question is whether or not if that error is why you're not worried about the dust that hit. Uh, essentially, yes. What we do is, well, what I didn't show you is the, for each of the individual hits that we see on the mirror, we measure the wavefront error that that hit produced. And that the wavefront error, the actual imperfection left from that strike is of the order after 41 hits, the average error elevated our wavefront error by less than a nanometer. That's less than one nanometer out of 150. So uh, the, the bottom line is the micrometeoroids that have struck us, yes, we can measure them, but the actual wavefront error that they're given is in the in you know roughly about a nanometer, so it's not affecting our performance whatsoever. Thank you, uh, Fabrice. Would like to know why was Christmas chosen as the launch date? <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> uh, it just turned out that way. We were actually going to launch on December twenty third, but there was uh, there was a couple of holds and there were a couple of minor problems that we had to had to reconcile. So it just turned out that it just turned out to be Christmas Day. And by the way, I can tell you, we had a bunch of, um, you know, this was right during COVID. And there were a lot of precautions that we had, but there were a lot of dignitaries that were actually uh, supposed to show up. And people were getting very upset because, you know, the dignitaries had to be in there. So a lot of people that wanted to be there couldn't be. Well, when it got delayed to Christmas Day, none of the dignitaries wanted to come. They wanted to spend Christmas with their families. So, you know, we didn't have an awful lot of big audience in the in the control center, which was okay for me because we were just too busy watching our screens. Uh, and Lou has a question about the images that we see since they're infrared. Uh, the, the question says, I'm assuming that they are artificially colored images. Yeah, well, and, and that is true. That is true, but and I had to have I've had a lot of um, dealings with the press on this. The word artificial coloring is has probably the wrong context. Certainly, they you know if you were looking at these things, you know they don't look like that to your to your eye. But if your eye 
was uh, was an infrared eye. We color those things in a convention such that you're in the kind of convention that your eye would see. So the short wave infrared are colored blue. The medium uh, medium wave infrareds are colored in the you know in the yellow, and the longer wave infrareds are colored in the red. So yes, trick, strictly speaking, those colors are artificial, but we color them the way the wavelength would look to your eye if your eye was infrared. Thank you. Uh, and then our own uh, fantastic executive director, Donna McCormick, uh, would like to know, uh, what's next for you? What's next? Uh, what, are there any plans for the next Webb telescope? Well, yes. Uh, and um, I, I wish I could have showed it, but uh, we're going to be unveiling it tomorrow. Um, right now, uh, myself and about five of my colleagues who were on the lead, who are leading the James Webb, we're starting to do the cartoons for the next space telescope. Uh, and it's called uh, Habitable Worlds Explorer. Uh, it won't be completed in, you know, in my lifetime, I think, but hopefully, you know, maybe in 20 years. Uh, it's it's going to be, uh, we hope to be a, about an eight meter telescope. It'll be an ultraviolet visible infrared telescope. It'll be the, basically the same wavelengths as Hubble, but it'll be eight meters. And its primary science mission will be to look at and examine and find terrestrial planets around other stars and analyze them to see if they're uh, if they're habitable. Wonderful. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Uh, Julia would like to know what has already been rewritten by the James Webb Telescope? Well, uh, a lot of the a lot of the journal articles are only coming out. You know, when the um, when astronomers uh, have get time on the James Webb, they are able to um, uh, they have one year to publish their data, and if they don't publish their data in a year, it becomes public. But we do have certain data that has already become public. The first thing is um, the early galaxies are much bigger and brighter than we thought. So it appears that galaxies are, are forming much quicker than we had thought in our early universe. And this is, uh, this is starting to, astronomers are getting excited over this. They weren't expecting that. We're also seeing, um, in, as you know, in most galaxies, there are uh, the centers of the galaxies have massive black holes. Well, we also see that these massive black holes that should have taken uh, uh, much longer to, you know, to grow into that big, we're finding pretty massive black holes in the early universe, which once again was unexpected. It, it's along the lines of, hey, these things are being put together much quicker than we thought. We have detected, we've already detected certain molecules and exoplanets that we were not expecting. And this is, by the way, not, not an area where I'm very well versed, but one of the first unexpected molecules that they found around a, a, an exoplanet was sulfur dioxide. And the relevance of that, they, uh, the planetary uh, physicists said, hey, the only way to put this together is through some photochemical processes that we weren't expecting. And uh, so that was coming out as well. We've also um, started to find... Uh, are started to look at stars, very, very massive stars that are producing more dust than would have been expected. So those are some of the things, but I think in the next couple of months when the actual journal articles came out, come out, you'll see a lot more of these details. So the next question, it might be my favorite question uh, by Heba. Uh, what is something that went wrong during the process of construction of the telescope that could have saved time and money? Oh, there was a lot of things. I mean, I'm not gonna. Yeah, there was. Um, I there were a couple of design errors that were made. There were a couple of human errors that were made. Um, you know, uh, just uh, we had a we had uh, there was an accident with the testing where we uh, ended up uh, frying over. We we put over voltage into what we call a pressure transducer, uh, uh, an instrument that tells us how much fuel we have left. So we had to retrofit and put in new transducers. That was not a, 
that was not one of our prouder moments, but you know, these things, the, these things happen. Uh, there were a couple of design flaws that we had to fix when we, for instance, when we were shaking the telescope, uh, as we were shaking it, when, when, when you shake something like a telescope, you, uh, you start at very low levels and you build them up and you build them up. And then we were seeing a response that we didn't expect. So, and, and this was before we hit the final level. So we, we stopped, we took about a month to make sure we understood what that response was. When we understood the response, we made sure that we put the right uh, damping into it. And then we, uh, we made sure that when we uh, cranked it up to full the full test level, that that damper was incorrectly. And it was, so were the things like that. Those were the type of mistakes that were made. When I tallied it up, I figured, you know, human error accounted for about maybe a year. Uh, design flaws, design mistakes that I'm not ashamed of, by the way. This We've never made a design like this. So design mistakes probably might have counted for one or two years. So that would be three. But a lot of our delays are, with, are due to funding. And, um, you know, uh, I, I don't have the exact tally, but I estimate probably three to four years of delay is because of funding. Now, NASA is a discretionary organization. We get our, we get our funding on a yearly basis. So every year, for the first seven years that I was on the job as lead systems engineer, we would go to headquarters and to Congress and said, here's how much money we need this year. And for the first seven years, they would say, well, Here's how much you're going to get. Do the best you can with it. So uh, the, the, a lot of our delays, a, a good portion of our delays, were due just to funding. And I'm not complaining about that. You shouldn't complain about it. As I said, we, there are bigger things for, the, for Congress to fund, certainly bigger things. But if you're not given the money that you, you need and you're, there, you're told to, uh, hey, uh, do the best you can with this, well, that's going to cause a delay. And it did. Uh, Donna has another question. How long is the scope expected to stay in service? Is this going to be another uh, Mars rover? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Uh, we designed it. It, it. it is required to last for five years, but we designed it to last for 10. Okay. And the primary consumable, the primary life uh, limiting thing on board is the propellant. And because Arian put us in such a great orbit, we have well over 20 years worth of propellant on board. So I, it is my expectation that this mission will go for 10 years and that even, uh, even 10 to 15 years, if, it's, if things start failing, they'll fail relatively gracefully. And I, I have every expectation that maybe at the end of 15 years, instead of four science instruments working, okay, we'll probably have three. At the end of 17, maybe two. But I have every expectation that we're going to meet the 10-year goal on this. That'd be incredible. Uh, we just have one more follow-up, and that's from Jason, who is just uh, back to that math question and asking uh, why a simple summation instead of a weighted summation? Uh, I don't know what you mean by a weighted summation there, Jason. Can you, uh, can you elaborate on, on what you mean by that? Feel free to unmute, Jason if you're still with us. Like weighted the noise and then summed them up. Well, Jason, when you, when you look at things like noise, um, what you do is um, there's a very special way to, to add the way noise adds. And it doesn't add like, uh, like the normal arithmetic. It doesn't add like A plus B plus C plus D. It actually adds in a manner that you'll learn later on called RSSing, root sum squaring. And it has to do with the way that errors add up, random errors add up, as opposed to the way systematic things add up. Um, as I say, I, uh, I apologize. I, I couldn't do you justice on this unless I had a whiteboard error, but I think, um, I, I think as you progress in school, you'll learn uh, you'll learn about what we call RSSing. 
Okay. And I Jason, did I, I I met you at the Intrepid a couple of years ago? Is that correct? Yes. Today, this year. Okay. Okay. Well, J and Jason, what, what grade are you in? What grade are you in right now? Um, middle school, but I'm eight. Okay. Well, I can guarantee you that by the time you get to high school, you'll be able to tell me why we are eight SSDs. years old. <laughs> I'm eight years old right now. But and uh, you're a very impressive eight year old. <laughs> Thank you. And I love your presentation. Why, thank you. I have a funny feeling that I'm going to be working for you someday. <laughs> yeah, I think we all might be. The, uh, another great question. Can either the, the James Webb or the Hubble photograph each other? Uh, no, they, uh, <laughs> first of all, um, Hubble, could, Hubble could photograph James Webb. And, but, but as you can see right there, that's no big deal. A 16-inch telescope can photograph James Webb. It will only look like a star. You won't discern anything. So, the, but James Webb will never photograph Hubble because we would never point it toward the Earth. Well, that was the last of the questions we have in the chat. So, I want to take a moment to say thank you uh, so much for this. This was a, an incredible presentation, um, and it's been great having you. Uh, I hope uh, we can bring you back again in the future. Sean, it was my pleasure. I want to thank everyone for their questions, their attentions, and, um, you know, enjoy the images. The, I think the good stuff is yet to come. Thank you. And as I said thank earlier, we'll, we'll be posting this um, rec recording on our, on our YouTube channel, uh, uh, Hamptons Observatory, and I think Donna has placed uh, that link in the chat if anybody wants to go back and grab that before you go. So thank you again. Uh, I hope everybody thank enjoyed you. it and have a wonderful evening or day. That's thank just you. beginning for some of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night. <laughs> a good night. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you.